Well, I took up the cross You left for me Took up the cross mm, That set me free From trouble time The victory Took up the cross that set me free. Well, my name is John. I uh, I know all most of you guys know me, but um, Dad asked if I would share, so I asked God what He wanted me to share about, and uh, still don't quite know yet. <laughs> But I believe that's the way it's supposed to be. Because the Lord says on that day when they, you know, put you in front of trials and they do different things, they said, don't worry what you're supposed to say. Because the Lord will give you the words to say. So I know that the Holy Spirit is living and active and his word is living and active. And it's sharper than a double-edged sword and it's going to pierce to the heart. But it's the word of God, not the word of John, that pierced to the heart. It's not my thoughts that make sense to me that I studied up and said, I'm going to convince you. I can't convince you of who God is. God has to convince you. And it's only you, when you take time alone with God, that he's going to reveal himself to you. That's where life change happens. That's where life comes from. That's where it comes from, from a place of being with God. Not from talking about God, but being with God, alone, on your own. Music, no music, whatever you want to do. Just by yourself alone with God. I've been thinking about a passage of scripture, John chapter 17, for a while. And just keep coming back to it. And this scripture is Jesus. Who, he's praying for his disciples before, they, before he goes. He's going to get killed that night or the next day. And so he prays. It's like, you know, he teaches us to pray. And he says, you know, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. All this stuff. It's a pretty short prayer. But then Jesus prays, you know. And we get to see Jesus actually pray. And, and, and when Jesus prays, it, it's awesome to hear. He's just pouring his heart out before his Father. And if you read it, and I encourage you to read it, um, the, the theme of the prayer is he says, it starts it out, and I do actually need a Bible for this. <laughs> he starts it out, thanks, Dad. And he says, Father, the hour has come. I'm just going to read through this, actually. Let's just hear what God's saying. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that to all who you have given him, he may give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I manifested your name to the men who, who you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I have come forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine. I, glorify, I am glorified in them. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them. Keep them in your name, those whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth, O oh God. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that I may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray these for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as we, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, 
and the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and they may be perfected in one, that the world may know that you have sent me, and I have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Just hear, I just hear what Jesus is saying. He just he just wanted us to be one with the Father. That was his prayer. Like it summed up all in that. He says, God, that they may be one with you. And I know for a lot of my life, I've lived trying to, trying to like, you know, get to know God, but, but not really knowing him, not to be one with him. The goal of Jesus is that we would be one with the Father as he is one with the Father. And Jesus, we look at Jesus as the Trinity. Like his Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They were three gods in one, you know? And then he's adding a fourth strand where he says that they may be one with us. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to get all theological on it. But I just believe that Jesus wants us to be as much one with the Father as he was one with the Father. In Revelations chapter 1, Jesus talks about that. He says that, or, or I, guess, I guess how it goes is he says, the, uh, Jesus who is the only begotten of God, he died, and it says that he might uh, lead the way for many brethren, or something like that is how it goes. And, it said, and, 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 and the reason why he's, he goes from the only begotten of God, right, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, and Jesus isn't the only son of God now, because when Jesus died, he prepared the way for many brothers and sisters, and that's who we are. And it's because when Jesus died on the cross, he did something for us. He, he did something that God, from the beginning, has been wanting to do, which was to bring the Spirit of God back inside of mankind. That's the life of God. And that's what we as Christians, that's the difference between us and the rest of anybody else on the planet. It's not that we're, we look different or we, we act, you know, it's not all that. It's that we possess the life of God. That's the difference. It's not that, you know, we go to church. It's not that we try to be good people. It's not that we tithe or we give. There's a lot of good people in the world that do good things. But as a believer, the difference between us and the rest of the world is that we, have the, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones who have God manifested in us. Jesus could leave because he's leaving in his place himself in us. And that we are Jesus to this world. And what I've heard is that somebody says, you know, you might be the only gospel that this lost and dying world will ever read. Because in our life is the gospel. It's the good news. That it wasn't because we were sinners that God died for us. Yes, God had to die because we messed up and we sinned. There was penalty for sin. It's because he loved us. You don't bail somebody out of jail just because, oh my gosh, they messed up. Well, I'm going to bail them out of prison. Yes, they messed up. You have to bail them out of prison. But you know what? It's because you care about that person. There's a reason for that. God sees the value in every single human being on this earth, and it was for love that he died for us. It was, it was for God so loved the world that he died for us, not because we're the scum of the earth. When I look at myself before God, I'm the, I'll say I'm the scum of the earth. But God sees a son. He sees, he sees who he created us to be. There's a reason why he created mankind in the first place, and it was because he wanted relationship with us. And he put, it says, when he formed man from the dust of the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And then it says Adam and Eve did their thing, and they, the Holy Spirit left or whatever. I don't know how it all worked. It said they died, and they didn't die but the Holy Spirit left. And what Jesus has been wanting to do from the beginning, the whole master plan of God is that he would get his spirit back inside of us. The spirit of God, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. It's God himself, the spirit, the essence of God. It's his life. 
And that's what he's been wanting to do inside of us. And the whole Old Testament was just setting the stage for when Jesus would come. And when Jesus died on the cross, his blood was the new covenant. A covenant. Like the closest thing we have to a covenant these days is marriage, which is real watered down in today. In the church and outside of the church, I think it's like 50% of marriages end in divorce. In the church and outside of the church. But when you make a covenant, like when I stood on the altar before all of my friends and family with Sarah, who's not here right now, my awesome wife, I stood up there and I made a covenant promise to her that I was going to that we were going to be together till death do us part. Till death do us part. Like, it's a covenant. Like, I promise that I'm in this for the long haul, through thick, through thin, whether you change, whether I change, no matter what, no matter what happens. If you get in a car accident and you don't look the same anymore, whether you go through menopause and you act different or something like that, like, death do us part. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even know what I'm saying right now, but I know there's some people who know what I'm saying. So... But I'm just speaking it into existence from now, you know? Like, I know that God's got this. He said, and, and when, you make, when we make a promise, it's like a promise. Like, I'm in this thing, okay? Well, God made a promise with us. It was a covenant. That's what happened with Jesus. But it was so serious of a covenant that he didn't even use sheep and bulls like he used before. He used his son. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Jesus is life. You're worth the life of my son. And he put it on the line. It says, you know, there's that verse that says, like, you know, if if one of your members causes you to stumble, cut it off. Because it's better that you enter the kingdom of heaven with one less arm than you go into hell. Well, God said, you know what? He took that to the next level. And he said, you know what? You guys are all going to hell. I'm going to send my son to die. I'm going to cut him off for the sake of, of you guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, you guys are so, we are so worth the blood of Jesus in God's eyes. It's not... Like, oh, you're so worthless people. I just wish that you would see how sinners you are and stuff like that. Like, yes, we're sinners. But we need, to, we need God's life in us for any life change to happen. That's the thing, is it's not that you come to church so that you can be a better person. It's you come to church because here we have fellow believers to encourage each other in love and good works. That's why we come here. So we can be together and challenge each other. Be like Jesus. Stand in the truth. Don't give in to the lies of Satan. You walk by the spirit that's inside of you and walk in strength and walk in power because that's who you're supposed to be. You're not supposed to give in to the lies of Satan anymore. They're done. They've been done. Since the cross, he was defeated. He got cast down. And we stand on the truth. And we overcome him, like it says in Revelation chapter 11, by the blood of the lamb. That's how we overcome Satan. Not by trying harder, not by doing harder. It's by walking in the, in the spirit and power of God. And that's what he calls us to. That's what our calling is. Oneness with God. And you, and I know that we all know this. We can't change us. We can't change us. I can't, I can't be like God in me. And Jesus makes it clear in, well, Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse I think it's like 14 or 13 or something like that. It says, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, start with what Jesus said. Jesus says in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing, right? And he's talking about the vine. He's like giving this analogy to his people. And he says like, okay, like I, I am the vine and my father, he's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts off. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And then he says, basically, like, you have to abide in me, for apart from me, you can do nothing. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, or whatever it is, he says, I can do all things. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there's this, like, huge difference here. Jesus is saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. And Paul is saying, in Jesus, I can do all things. It's not you. Me, I can do nothing. In Jesus, I can do all things. It's because he can do all things. And he can do it inside of us. You know, like I read through the Bible, and I'm looking at the disciples, you know, and I look at their life, and I look at the way that they live. Before Pentecost, these guys were a bunch of knuckleheads. You know what I'm saying? They really were. But after the Holy Spirit came in Pentecost, okay, these guys were Jesus walking around. I mean, the shadow of Peter and Paul was falling on people, and they were getting healed. 
You know what I mean? It's be, not because of them. It was because of the Spirit of God. And that's what we're called to. And I just really feel it pressing on my heart that that's what I'm supposed to talk on today, is that we are not called to just be better people. We're not called to be John, who's like polishes himself up and is a little bit better than the guy next to me. I am called to abide in the Spirit of God and to know God. And from that life comes the fruit of God, which is love and joy and peace. And I manifest the presence of God in every situation. So now I'm not controlled by what's going on outside of me because I have the Spirit of God inside of me. I'm not going, I don't have to worry about what other people are doing. If you have the Spirit of, if we have the Spirit of God inside of us, it doesn't matter what so-and-so says because they're going to come to us and they're going to try and overcome us with evil. That's been Satan's plan since the beginning to just, everybody's just going to react to each other. But no, if, if I walk by the Spirit of God, I have the ability, in Jesus, he can overcome evil with good in this situation just to manifest the life of God. And so I just really feel that burning on my heart that that's the point. But, you know, um, a lot of time, I mean, we've all, I don't know, I just think of this analogy that, uh, like, you go on a road trip, right? And if you go out on a road trip, say you're trying to get to, uh, I don't know, like, let's say Atlanta. Nowadays, we have GPSs. You can just, like, plug, the, plug in the GPS, the address of where you're going, and you're on your way, and there you go. Um, one time, me and Sarah were in Ireland, and we didn't have a GPS, and so we're sitting there with, like, this massive map, and we're, like, trying to figure this thing out. So respect for all the people who had to deal with maps back in the day. So, but now we have, like, a GPS. You know, you plug in your location, and boom, off you go, and there you go. You get to it. But this is the thing. If you didn't know where, well, yeah, true, the GPS doesn't quite know all the places where it's going. You know, they might build a bridge, and then the GPS is like, oh, you got to turn a U-turn, or I don't know. It doesn't know everything. But this is the thing. You, if you know where you're going, you can follow the directions and you can get there. If you have an idea of what you're supposed to, of what you're supposed to do, like, like in art, like I do, I, I like to draw, and, um, you know, I'll look at a picture that I'm supposed to draw, like I did one for Mr. Sullivan, Mrs. Sullivan back there, and, you know, I have this, like, template of what I'm supposed to draw, and I'll take it, and I'll grid it out, and I'll figure out, like, what I'm supposed to do. I know Tim looks at the sky, and he just, like, takes a mental picture, and then he does it. I can't do it like that. But... When you look at what you're supposed to be doing, you know, like whatever the model is, you can go ahead and you can like replicate that. I think the sad thing inside of the church today, and I'm just talking about my own life, is I didn't even know I was supposed to live like Jesus. You know what I mean? Like I didn't realize that I was, but like we say, what would Jesus do and all that kind of stuff. When it really comes down to it, what we look at Jesus as is Jesus was this God man who came down to earth and lived a life that I'll never, ever, 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 am ever supposed to live in my entire life that I'm just supposed to be like every normal person out here and I'm supposed to read my Bible and I'm supposed to dig and try and do as hard as I can do and I'm going to fail and I'm going to mess up and you know what? That's just the way it is for the rest of my life and then, you know, when I'm done, I'm going to die and God's going to see that I really tried hard. No! That was not what Jesus wanted at all. We're living like the disciples pre-Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? We're just living like those guys who are out there who are following in Jesus' footsteps and we're trying to say the right thing. There's a little bit of power here. He gives us authority here, you know, and we're, and we're trying to say the right thing. We're trying to do the right stuff, and that's awesome, but that's not the point. We aren't supposed to be just better versions of us. We're supposed to receive the Spirit of God. Jesus made it really simple. He said, if any man wants to come after me, he said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Because if anybody wants to save his life, he's going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will save it. And he talks about, you know, the whole analogy of the, the vine and the branches. He talks about the tree and being grafted into the tree and all this kind of stuff. It's not, it, Jesus isn't talking about, you know, and, and there's all these different things that we see, you know, like a John Newton, he was blind and now he sees and all these different things. It's not that we would be better versions of John or Billy or Jimmy or Willie. It's, it's not that we would do that. It's that we would manifest the life of Jesus inside of us. We have to receive from another source of life. And that's why he says, if any man wants to come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross and follow me. That's how Paul's able to say in Galatians chapter 2, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. For the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and 
gave himself for me. That's the life that we're supposed to live. And so the challenge that I have is just to challenge the way that we're thinking about following Jesus. Not that we would follow Jesus with this, I'm going to do my best today to try and be like Jesus. No. When you know God and you receive of his spirit, which only he can do, just humble. God, I can't do this. You have to do this in me. He is going to do it. He's going to do it. And that's been, that has been God's plan since day one when he, created, when he created man. That was the goal. The goal is that he would fill them with himself inside of them, that they would be created not just in his image and look like him, but with his life and be able to live like him. Now, what I'm not trying to say is, okay, like you're supposed to live perfect and that's just the way it is. No, Paul said, I press on. Not that I have been perfected, but that I, I press on towards the goal, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's why Paul in Romans chapter 8, he goes deep into your mentality because this is where the battle is. It's not against flesh and blood. The battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against yourself. It's not against the people at work. It's simple. The battle is against the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places. That's what Paul said. It's clear and simple. And he's trying to, this battle is being fought in our mentality. That's why so many times what Jesus said is, why do you have so little faith? Faith is, 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 is believing what God says. And belief is a mindset, a mentality that this is what God says, and I'm believing it. I'm standing on the truth. But a lot of times we want to go by the way that we feel. Because that's the way that we're taught, you know? I feel really angry. And so we got to go to a counselor because we got to deal with anger management, you know? Or I feel really, like, depressed. i got to go to a counselor. i got to talk through this because I can't get rid of this feeling. You're right, you can't get rid of that feeling because it's the flesh, you know? And if you're going to rely on the flesh, the flesh can't get the flesh out. You have to rely on the Spirit of God to receive the Spirit. And I'm speaking from somebody who has walked through that. So back about four years ago, I had this uh, experience that was, I'd never had something like this before, actually more, I think it was like back in 2012, yeah, so wow, seven years ago now, um, I remember I was in this conference, and we were worshiping just like we were today, and it was so awesome, just the spirit of the Lord was there, and I was just filled with this presence of God, it was so awesome, we were worshiping, and all of a sudden, I got this, this, this feeling of anxiety, just like, came over, came over me, and my, my heart started, like, beating, like, out of my chest, and I was like, like, what's going on? Like, we're in the middle of worship service. It was so random, so I, like, walk outside. I'm like, what the heck is, like, what is this? I have no idea what's going on. Actually, that conference is going on right now, the one that I was at. It's a, it's a friend of ours who has it uh, up in Ohio, and I was just praying. I was like, you know, Satan, you know, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. What's going on here? I don't receive this or whatever, and it didn't go, and so I just, I'm like, huh, like, I don't know what this is. I went back inside, and it kind of lingered. Then it kind of went away. And then it happened a couple days later, like, when I got back. I just felt like this, like, it was like a panic attack. Like, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think right. It was, like, weird. And so I was like, okay, this is weird. And, and then it happened again. And it started, like, happening, like, every day. And then it was, like, multiple times a day. And then it was, like, constant throughout the day, you know? And then I had like trouble sleeping. And this went on for months and months and then years. I had trouble sleeping. I, was, I felt so insecure. I felt like, like I just, it was just like this anxiety, self-consciousness that drove me towards depression. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I just feel so down and I, I, I can't get out of this. Like nobody gets me, you know, and I, I talk to people and they're like, brother, you just need to believe in God. And I'm just like, you believe in God. I'm believing in God. And this isn't changing. What's the matter with you? You know, everybody's trying to fix your problems and tell you what you didn't do. And you tell them that I did that already, you know, and they're just trying to like, you know, let me just reprogram. Let me just hit a couple buttons here. And it's like, listen, it's been like two years since I've had this. I already done that and that and that and that and all the other stuff. I went forward in every single prayer service. I'm telling you, I probably had many of you guys pray for me in that time. And um, it went on for years. And I'm telling you, it would still be going on if I just, ah, the Lord is so good. And he's so patient. 
And I'm so glad. I can, I can honestly look back on that. Years of anxiety and depression, and I can understand where people can have these suicidal thoughts in that place, because I'm telling you, it was, it was serious. But what I learned is that I'm, I, I'm so thankful for the truth, because what I learned through that experience was that even though you can feel so strongly something, just feel you, and, and I'm sure all of us have had different experiences like that, it's not supposed to happen. As somebody who walks in the, in the spirit of God, the spirit of God is not anxious. He is peace. And if it's the spirit of God who is inside of me, and it's no longer John who lives, but Christ who lives in me, then I am at peace. Not because I feel at peace, because he's peaceful. And there's this battle that Paul talks about, about putting to death the old man and walking in the new man in newness of life. And that is a mindset. It's the fight of faith that we stand on the truth and we walk by that. But I feel like in the church so many times we're justifying our life by our experience and not by the word of God. That's why Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in your word. Your word is truth. Because the thing is, is we walk by what we see, not by what we don't see. Because what is not seen is eternal. What is seen is temporary. And we're using logic, not based on the truth, to justify and think through our issues. And so what happens is I have this anxiety, and so I start thinking, oh my gosh, I feel so anxious, you know? And then I start feeling like insecure before people because it's like, I'm not very confident to like do this or do that. And so I just like let it just tear me up, you know? Start, I start giving into this insecurity, and I start thinking of all the negative things about me. And I'm just like, man, I'm not as good as so-and-so. And if I just didn't have this anxiety, like, I would be able to do that, and I'd be able to do this. And I, and I couldn't work very well, and it's just in my mind. And, I mean, this was every single day, just day in and day out, just thinking about, you know, worst-case scenario, like, what if I have this, you know? Like, this was, before, this was when I had met Sarah, but I was like, man, like, I can't be a husband like this. Like, I'm going to drive my wife crazy. Like, this is horrible, you know? And I, I can't have kids. My kids, you know, like, my, I can't live like this with kids. You know, they're going to have, like, this as their dad, you know, psycho, you know? And so I'm praying, and every day I'm praying, oh, God, like, would you just heal me from this? Oh, God, like, please just remove this anxiety from me, you know? And I pray for, like, hours. I'm like, maybe I didn't pray hard enough. Maybe I didn't pray in faith. So I'm like, oh, God, like, you have to heal me, you know? Just please just remove this from me. And I go to different things and get prayer. I'm so thankful that the Lord, for me, and I'm not saying for you, I, this is just my, this is what the Lord did in my life, is I remember sensing the Lord um, said one time, he said, John, he said, I'm not going to heal you. I was like, wow, what? This is crazy. Oh, this must be the thorn in the flesh, you know? Like, I'm just going to have to live with it, you know? And, and he's going to be glorified in my weakness. No. He said, I'm not going to heal you. Because if I healed you of this anxiety, what you don't know is you're already free. And I was not walking in freedom. It says, Jesus says, uh, you know, he talks to the Pharisees and he says, you guys are slaves. He says, but you, if you follow me, he says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What I didn't realize is that at the cross, Jesus made a way for all of us to be free from sickness, from the flesh, from the power of the enemy. Because at the cross, he destroyed and put to end the power of sin and death in this world. But it's only for those who believe and who walk in it. That's the, that's the caveat, is that we have to believe. Now, in the church, we preach you have to just believe that Jesus died for you. Yes, but you have to believe that you have been set free. And not walk by your experience, but by the truth of God. And walk in faith. But so many times we're preaching this watered down truth that says, oh man. Like people, when I was like having this, like I heard this sermon and this really rattled me. This guy said, you know what? Since I've been walking with God, I haven't been depressed in 25 years. And I was like, dude, this guy's on crack. Like everybody goes through depression. You know what I mean? Like everybody, I'm reading Martin Luther. 
And I'm reading like all these guys about the dark night of the soul. And I'm like, this is like a real thing. So, so I'm like, well, okay, so that's people's experience. Let me just reading the Bible, like reading Lamentations and trying to like see like, did Jesus ever have like a dark time? You know, like, you know, he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he's sweating blood and stuff like this. Like that was probably like his dark time. I don't know. Like I just read about Jesus and I just see even in his darkest time, it says he went into the wilderness. And the spirit drove him into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And the, and the devil tempted him day in and day out for 40 days and 40 nights. We only get like three snippets of what the devil tempted him with. I think that was just like the sampler. And so he's getting tempted day in and day out by the devil. And it says when he exits the wilderness, it says that he is filled with the spirit and power of God. You know what I mean? Like he exits his wilderness in more power than he entered it. You know what I mean? And it's because... He set his mind on the truth. Every single one of Satan's lies that he stuck at him, he's like, hey, you're pretty hungry. He's like, yeah, I'm hungry. Oh, why don't you turn these stones into bread? He's like, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He's like, well, if you're the son of God, you know, why don't you cast yourself down from this tower so that everybody can just see that, oh my gosh, you're God. You know, it'll just be clear. And he's like, it is written, man, God, you shall not put God to the test. You know, and he just fires back at every single one of Satan's lies with the truth. But in the church, I'm sad to say, like, I don't see a lot of us standing on the truth. I'm not saying that you guys in here, but I'm just saying for my own self, you know what I mean? And take it for how you will. I wasn't standing in the truth. I wasn't standing on the fact that God doesn't give anxiety. He's not going to give you something that's from the devil. Did God create anxiety? No. Or else he wouldn't say, don't be, an be anxious for nothing. Jesus wouldn't say be anxious for nothing if he didn't give you the power to be able to walk in that truth. The thing is, is he wouldn't say, yeah, you know, go and heal the sick if he didn't give us the power to walk into that. It's the spirit of God why, these, why we're free from these things. It's because of what Jesus did at the cross and realizing that when Jesus died on the cross, what he did is he broke the power of Satan's rule on this earth. When man, it said that Adam, the first man, the life, you know, when, when Adam was in the garden and he ate the fruit, he allowed, you know, there was ground that was given to the enemy. There was, there, it said that death reigned from Adam all the way until the law. And through the law, there, there was this law of sin and death that was ruling, which was exactly what all of us feel. It's like when we get angry, it's like, I can't not be angry. It's the flesh. That's what it was. It was this flesh that we live in, okay? And that's what Adam gave ground to. But when Jesus came, he put an end to the power of sin and death. He broke that curse that was over mankind. He put to death, you know, all of that stuff. He cast Satan out, and he, and, and he said, and now he says the kingdom of God, the rule of God has come. That's what he kept saying. If you read through the New Testament, like, I don't know what the number is, but in almost every chapter, Jesus is saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, because the kingdom of God is here. He says, well, where's the kingdom of God? It is amongst you. It's in your very midst. It's at hand. It's right here. You know, if I cast out demons by the, the, by the prince of demon, then that is what it is. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God is upon you. It was God, the reason why Jesus could cast out demons and the reason why we can cast out demons and, and people are healed is because the kingdom of God is here. And in the kingdom of God, sickness is illegal because it's, it was with the curse. But Jesus came to declare the truth. It's who he is. Now, what I'm not saying is go and condemn yourself because you're not healed of something. That's not the truth. That's, that's going right back to Satan's logic. And he's going to do that. He's going to try and say, oh, well, if you're the son of God, then why aren't you healed? And it is not about that. You walk in faith day by day. If every day you're walking and, and you're, you're having to I still get anxiety every once in a while. It'll come on, but I walk in the truth. And I stand on the truth. It doesn't matter if I have anxiety for the rest of my life. It doesn't change loving people. It doesn't change the spirit of God inside of me. It doesn't change that today is a good day because God made it and he's in me and I can love people and I can walk in the truth. And I can stand on the truth today. It doesn't change that, you know? And if you're walking in sickness and you pray and you ask the Lord to heal you, fine, great. You know what? Walk in the truth today. You just keep walking in the truth. You keep seeking the Lord. You thank the Lord for what he's doing inside of your life. Just thank you for the good work that's going in on inside of you. And thank you for his work that is working inside of you, you know? And just stand on that truth. And you just keep walking forward. You know what? At some point in time, that sickness has got to just fall off. 
because it's got nothing to hold on to because you're just the spirit of God is inside of you you're walking in the truth and the Holy Spirit is filling you you know and this is the reason why we like why I can honestly say like I never ever need to be depressed ever again in my life why because it's the spirit of God who's inside of me it's him who's doing it it says that you know uh, if you believe in my words as the scripture says this is Jesus talking out of your innermost being will come rivers of living water, right? And, and he said this, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think it was John was saying something like that. And so how can I, John, be depressed if the spirit of joy, like the source of joy, lives inside of me? How can I? Either God's lying or I'm not believing God is not a liar, and if the Spirit of God is inside of me, and I live by another life that is inside of me, I just have to set my mind on it. But I think for so many of us, we're, look, we're waiting for the circumstance to change instead of believing the truth. And what I'm encouraging myself and all of us, just believe God. Set your mind on the truth. Believe what he said, and just day in and day out, just seek to do what God would have you do in that day. In humility, in love, walk by the Spirit of God. Thank Him for the work that He is doing inside of you. Don't wait until you see something change. Walk by faith. Fight the battle of faith. It's, it's, Satan is trying to get into your mind. And he does it, he, he gets you this way, and then he'll get you this way. So he'll say, you know, he'll get you feeling super depressed because of your circumstances. Like, oh, you totally messed up at work. You shouldn't have done this or you shouldn't have done that. Or you totally messed up in this relationship. You said something that you weren't supposed to say. How could you do that? You call yourself a Christian and you just said that? Like, what kind of an imbecile are you? That's the way, you know, Satan just rips you down, you know? And then you're like, oh my gosh, you're right. I'm so sorry. And he's like, well, you should be. And now grovel on your feet before God because he's so angry at you. He's about to cast you out of heaven. He's going to go erase your name for the book of life. You know, you are ridiculous. And all this stuff. And, you know, he just fills your mind with all this negative thoughts, you know? And then you're just, oh, okay, all right, God, oh, please. And we think that we're being righteous now. I've got to feel sorry enough, you know? If I just feel sorry enough, then, you know, maybe God will forgive me. And then he'll get you on this side where he's now, you know, saying something else to you. But what I find is there is no, or this is what the Bible says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because God set us free from the law of sin and death. Because what the law of law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful, sinful flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. And what God did through Jesus, you know, we don't have to be scholars. Just know this. What God did through Jesus set me free from my old man. And now there's a new man to walk in. But so many of us as believers, we, and we literally call ourselves believers, are not believing what God said about who we are. And we give ourselves excuses to walk in the old man and to walk by the power of Satan. And that's exactly what Satan wants. And that's why many are going to come to him on that day. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, we did this and we did that. And we did many miracles in your name. Miracles! They believe. And he's going to say, I didn't know you. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus goes through this whole teaching, and he's talking about, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the, you know, meek, for they shall be called sons of God. And he just goes through this, and then he says, you have heard it said of those of old, that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I, you know, but I say to you, no, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, Turn your other cheek to him. Or he says, you have heard it say, love your enemy, or love your friends and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love those who despitefully use you. Love your enemies. Love those who curse you and use you and abuse you and all that kind of stuff. He says, you have heard it say, you know, he goes through this step by step about like living a life of love, you know. And he says, don't do your good deeds so that they may be seen by men. And, you know, this is how you should pray. And don't judge lest you be judged. And, you know, um, take the speck out of your own eye, or take the log out of your own eye instead of trying to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And he says, walk by faith and, and, and make sure you're watching out for the, fair, you know, the, the, the wolves dressed in sheep clothing and all this kind of stuff. He goes through this whole thing where his whole premise of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is living a life of love, radical love that nobody had ever seen. That was like 
It was just Jesus. It's the way Jesus lived day in and day out. People tried to spit in his face, and he loved them. The people tried to crucify him, and he still loved them. He's on the cross, and he's like, Father, forgive these guys. They have no idea what's going on. Like, he had this incredible love for the people that was around him. He's just like, God, they just don't even know. Like, they don't know. That's the way we're supposed to live. Like, around, with the people around us. Like, when somebody's yelling at you, like, they don't even know that you love them and that they can live in love. And they, you know, they don't realize that they're just giving in to Satan. And it's not for me to go and judge that person. It's for me to just love them. Just continue to love them. And just speak the truth in love. And continue to speak the truth over the life in love, you know? And Jesus says all of that in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in the end, he says, he says, um, he who hears these words of mine and does them is likened to a man who builds his house on the rock. And when the winds come and the storm comes and beats against that house, it will stand because he's built his house upon the rock. But he who hears these words of mine and does not take ear to them or do them, he shall be likened to a man who builds his house on the sand. And when the wind comes and the rain comes, they beat against that house, and the house is destroyed. And it says the house shall fall, and great is that fall. And just before that, that's the passage where he talks about, he says, Many are going to come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, we did this and we did that in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so what I hear in this is Jesus isn't talking about, I, I did not hear Matthew 5, 6, or 7. Those who go to the temple, you know, talking to the Jews at the time. Those who tithe. Those who, you know, are very religious and stuff like that. What Jesus was talking about is somebody whose life was walking in love. That's what he was talking about. He didn't give us an excuse to be anxious. He gave us the spirit of God, which is peace. He didn't give us an excuse to be mad at so-and-so and and to have bitterness and then have to go to counseling and then have to figure out how I'm going to get over this. That's not how Jesus does it. Not saying anything against counselors, but I have to say, I truly believe that And God can use the counselors and stuff like that. I'm not speaking against doctors. I'm not speaking against counselors. I'm not saying against any of that. But I know in my own life, I went to counselors for this anxiety and depression. And I can tell you this, that I was not believing who God said I was. And I could go to counselors until I was counseled into everything and out of everything. But I can tell you this, that I have the Spirit of God inside of me. And if the Spirit of God is inside me, He's inside of you. And if, and if we as believers would just walk by the power that's inside of us and set our mind on the truth, there would be a lot of things that wouldn't be happening in the church. There would be, you know, anxieties and bitterness and unforgiveness because we're, we're using the world's logic to get ourselves through these different things. Because I feel this way, so therefore I am this way. No, you can feel super bitter. It's not like I don't ever feel like, you know, when somebody says something to me that's super hurtful, there's not like an instant where I have this like, you should respond like this or this or this or this. No, but you stand on the truth and say, you know what? I'm not going to receive bitterness. You know, you don't have to receive it. You know, when somebody says something that's really, really hurtful, that's on them. That's not on you. They can say whatever they want to say, but they don't know the love of God that's inside of me that I don't have to respond like that anymore. You know what? If they knew better, they might do better. And maybe they know better and they're still not doing better. But you know what? I walk, I love, not because that person loves me, but because God loves me. And I'm going to love because it's his spirit inside of me. And the Holy Spirit only has one, one response. That's love. That's all he responds. So if there is something that's inside of you that is pushing you towards anxiety, fear, depression, discouragement, bitterness, anger, and all that kind of stuff, it's not God. God isn't going to push you towards those things. And you know what? It's not even worth thinking about. Because if that's what it's leading you towards getting upset at somebody, just block it from the mind. That's why it says, set your mind on the truth. Put to death the deeds of the old man. And set your mind on the truth. That's what it means to put to death the deeds of the old man. But then somebody's going to say, well, John, like, no, you have to, like, reconcile your feelings. Not those feelings. Those feelings don't have reconciliation. You can think about being bitter at somebody until you're blue in the face, but every time you think about it in this box of they cross me the way they weren't supposed to cross me, there's no logic that's going to say in that situation like, oh, I'm going to let go of it. You're not going to. You're, you're stuck in this like circular logic that's 
they did this to me and that's wrong and so I'm going to do this to them and so they're going to do this and it's just going to stay here. No, Jesus is saying, don't get, get out of that. Life isn't about you anymore. If it's not about you, then it doesn't matter what they do to you because it's not about you anymore. Now you can be a sacrifice before God because it's not about you. And when somebody says something to me that's hurtful, my response can't be like, I can't believe that they would say that. Like, do they even know who I am? Like, come on, man. Like, if I said that to you, would you like it? You know, it doesn't matter if I said it to them. They might not like it. But you know what? God loves that person and he wants to show them a different way. That's overcoming evil with good. When somebody says something to you and you should respond wrong, and you just say, you know what, God, thank you for this opportunity. That here's an opportunity to manifest the truth and walk in love. This is a real opportunity to put to death the deeds of Satan. Because in this situation, when they say something to me, and I should respond negatively, but I don't, that's preaching the gospel. Like, that's living a life of light. Letting your light so shine before men that they would see your good works. And they're going to say, wow, that's, that's totally good. Like, what? I couldn't do that. How, how can you, like, get spit on and all this stuff like Jesus did? And him get on the cross. I mean, he's looking at people he healed. He's like, dude, I healed your mom. I healed your brother. I healed your sister. Hey, you can see, you know? Like, he's on the cross, and he healed these people. And they're crucifying him. And he's saying, Father, forgive them. This is the kind of love that can't come from me reading the Bible in my own mind and just trying to, like, you know, be a good person. This only comes from the life of God, which we have. And I'm not saying this as a condemnation to anyone. If you feel right now that, like, I'm judging you, it is not true. I'm, I'm encouraging us to stand in what we already are, which is the truth of God. He is inside of you, and he is filling you with his life. It's the truth. I'm not making this up. It's what Jesus did at the cross for every single one of us. And I'm not saying if you don't think like that, then shame on you. No, I'm saying just receive it. Because that's who God wants to be inside of us. And the goal for us as believers is that we would live like Jesus. And when we live a life from Jesus and from the truth, like that's what Satan is fearful of. Because he can keep people inside of the church and just keep lying to them. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can go to church. You can read the Bible. That's fine. They don't know the verse that says, Lord, Lord, when they come to me on that day. And he's going to say, I didn't know you. You know, Satan's like, go, go ahead, go in church. Look the part. Act the part. But you're not free. You're walking, in, you're walking in darkness. You're walking in your flesh. You're just, you don't even, maybe don't even know what you don't know, you know? But what I'm encouraging us is that there should be, Paul says that drunkenness and anger and, and disputes and dissensions and slanders and, and immorality and all that. He does this huge list of all these different things that he says should not even be named among you. But how many times in my own life can I look at my life and say, it shouldn't be named among me? No. I, I, there's a lot of times before that I'm looking at my life and it's like, no, I'm filled with bitterness at so-and-so and I'm frustrated at so-and-so and I can't be around so-and-so and this situation really gets me anxious. And does that mean that right now, like I've never felt that in my life? No. But if you don't have a goal of where you're going and you don't know what you're supposed to be like, you're never going to get there. What I'm challenging and encouraging you is that Jesus didn't say, all right, I want you guys to just, here's, oh, you're feeling anxious? Well, be anxious for nothing. That is unless, like, it doesn't go away when you think about that first. Like, then you can be anxious. That's fine. I'll give you a pass. No. He said, be anxious for nothing. Because he gave us his spirit and his presence. He's freed us from it. He's freed us from the power of sin and death. And it's by faith that we walk into this. And my challenge is to not to give into that. When you, when you come into a situation where, you know, you feel like, man, I can't believe so-and-so said such and such. Or when I start to feel like angry about something, that is just the flesh. That's the old man. Put it to death. That's not who you are anymore. You don't have to become something new. Just abide in Jesus. That's what Jesus talked about in John chapter 15. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, like, that's what it's about. It says, like, you will bear fruit. You can't make fruit come. What, what so many of us, I think, are trying to do and what I've tried to do so much in the past is I'm not abiding in the vine. I'm not receiving of the spirit of God and the life of God. I'm trying to manufacture fruit on my own 
in my flesh. But it says, put to death the deeds of the flesh, receive the Spirit, and walk by the Spirit, by setting your mind on things above, which is, I am free by the power of Jesus. And just walk into that. And so when I was feeling really anxious, I remember I had heard this guy who was talking about that. This guy's name is Dan Muller. Excellent teacher. Like, really, really phenomenal. He's just super simple, too. And I was listening to him, and he said, you know, you have to just set your mind on the truth. And I was like, that makes so much sense. Like, I, I'm not walking in, in you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bound by this anxiety because I'm letting this anxiety there. And what I realized is, like, God could have healed me, but it would have come right back because I wouldn't have changed my mentality on it. So as quickly as I, like, okay, I'm free from this and I feel free, I'm still walking by feelings. So once there's another circumstance where all of a sudden, boom, like, I start to feel anxious again. It's like, oh, my gosh, like, God, heal me again. He's like, no, John, I've already healed you. I've already set you free. Walk in it. So this is the thing that I see with most of us. And I'm not even going to say, like, this is what I saw with me. I am hoping for God to act in my life, but it's like he already has at the cross. I'm just not willing to believe it. I just wouldn't believe it. You know what? Satan's been, he's over and done for. You don't have to pray really hard to rebuke Satan. It's done. Like, it is done. It's just, it is. That's just the truth. It is what it is. And you know what? We have all of the angels in heaven to back us up on that. Like, it's done. Satan's rule is done. The kingdom of God is here. And we are ambassadors of that kingdom. We're not of this world because the spirit of God is inside of us. We have life from a different realm. And it's just walking in this world by the truth and to be lights in this world. And it's by setting our mind on the truth. And, and so that's just what I just really sense inside my heart is that we have to walk by it. Don't justify the flesh by logic, and by your experience. Look at the life of Jesus. If you don't see it in his life, and we're saying it's him who lives in us, not me, myself, then you can't just, we can't keep justifying that. Don't justify the deeds of the flesh because of your experience says something different. Believe Jesus' experience and walk in that. And by faith, I remember just like, out, like walking outside, like, feeling this anxiety, like super strong, and just being like, God, I thank you so much that your peace is inside of me right now, that it's you who are filling me. It's not myself. I can't get rid of this anxiety, but you already did, and you just stand on the truth, and you know what? To God, there's no reason to be anxious. Like, there's literally no logical reason to be anxious. I'm just thinking about all these little things like, oh, this happened, and that happened, and -and so-and-so thinks this. God's like, I don't care about all that stuff. He's sitting on his throne. The devil's been taken out, and here's his people, and he's just like loving on his people, God, like God doesn't have any anxiety. God isn't anxious right now. And I have no reason to be anxious if he has no reason to be anxious. If it's his life inside of me, then it's him who calls the shots in my life. If God is letting you be anxious, that's between you and God. You know, if he's saying, you know what, you're supposed to be anxious about this situation, he's not going to say it. But if you go to God for what you're supposed to do, if you don't see it in the life of Christ, then it shouldn't be in our life. Because that's what he calls us to, that we would walk and follow him, and be like him. And that's why the disciples, after they received the Holy Spirit, they were like Jesus. Now, were they perfect through and through? No. You see different times where, like, Paul and Barnabas fight about something or something like that. But they're putting to death the old man. They're walking by the truth day in and day out. They have the goal of what they're supposed to look at. We stand in the truth, and that's what we're supposed to be like. Stand in the truth. Have the goal that I'm supposed to be like Jesus. And I'm going to continue walking day in and day out. It's a journey. And God's not condemning you till you be like Jesus. He's in it with us now. That we would continue to put to death the deeds of the devil and walk in the truth. And as we receive the truth, our life is going to reflect the truth. And he's going to do it. And it's going to be of him. And then your light is going to shine before men. And people are going to say, wow, that was only God. That wasn't this guy's like hard work trying to figure it out or whatever. It's like there's something about him that's like just different. Like it, why aren't you angry at that person? He just said something to you. No, you didn't go to counseling. He just didn't take it. It just rolled off like water off a duck's back. It just, you, I'm not going to receive that. I'm going to overcome evil with good in every situation, every situation. So I just want to pray for you guys. Lord, I just thank you so much for what you are doing inside of us.
and that you have set each one of the people in here free. And I just thank you so much for your truth, Lord. We just receive from you your spirit. And I thank you for the good work you're doing inside of every single one of these people. That you love every single one of these people so much. You're not angry with them. You're not freaking out over, like, what's going on. Lord, I just ask that the words that I speak, that your Holy Spirit would use them to continue each one of these people in love and good work. That they would know that they are so loved. That there is no judgment in this. You're not judging them. You're calling them to the truth. And you want us to walk by the truth. And I just bless each one of these here that you would just continue to fill them with your spirit. That they would walk in the truth. If there's anything that is not of you, oh Lord, in this room, we just speak against it. Spirit of condemnation, get out in the name of Jesus. You're not allowed over any one of these people. They're not judged anymore. These are the sons and daughters of God. And God, I know you love these people so much. Every single one you created for a purpose. There's only one of each person in this world. You only create one. You don't create twos. And I'm so thankful for these guys here, Lord. Men, women, all of them, kids. I just bless each one of these that are here. And thank you, Lord, that you are doing this. And I just thank you, Lord, for what you're doing inside of our lives, that you're not changing. No matter how depressed we feel, your life and joy doesn't change. We have every reason to be joyful. We have every reason to be thankful. We have every reason to be just encouraged today. So thankful for that truth, God, because now it doesn't matter how we feel because your truth is bigger than how we feel. And we can walk in your truth no matter how we feel. And it's outside of it. We bless you, Lord, and thank you so much. Thank you for these, Jesus.